to mid 19th century, my three times great grandfather and several of his siblings moved from rural England to London. In this series called From Somerset to the City, I tell their stories while giving you hints on discovering your own family's history. It's 1851. My three times great grandfather, Henry Charles Hiscox, is 36 years old and working as the messenger to the Master of the Horse at Buckingham Palace. He and his wife Mary, who is 42, have five children. The sixth will be born in December of 1851. This is part two of the story of his older sister, Martha. Let's quickly review part one. By 1851, Martha has buried two husbands. She has two children, neither of which are living with her. Martha is no longer in London. She is in Ratley, Warwickshire, working for Viscount Villiers, who is the heir to the Earl of Jersey. The Earl of Jersey was the master of the horse when Henry Charles began working at Buckingham Palace eight years earlier. Martha is 43 years old. Martha's daughter, Emma Trotman, who she had with her first husband, Edwin, is living with Henry Charles and Mary at the Royal Mews at Buckingham Palace while working as a dressmaker. She was betrothed to a man named Joseph Wilson, and the bands of marriage were called in January, but Emma and Joseph didn't marry. As it turns out, Joseph is residing with Emma's aunt and uncle, William and Marianne Rickards. William is a theatrical wig maker. Joseph is a theatrical scene painter. Marianne is the youngest sister of Martha and Henry Charles. Martha's son, Charles William Henry Cater, is just 13 years old and living in Essex with Eliza Fulcher. Eliza shares a surname with Henry Charles's wife, Mary, so we assume she's related. But it's a rabbit hole we are not going down, which brings us to genealogy lesson number 10. Beware of rabbit holes. I'm not going to lie. I literally uncovered a family tragedy at the bottom of a rabbit hole. So I'm not saying don't go down them. I'm just saying beware of them and don't get sidetracked by mystery B while you are trying to stay focused on solving mystery A. Make a note, take a screenshot and file it appropriately. In this case, I'm putting it in the notes file in Mary Fulcher's profile in Ancestry because that is the first record I'll look at when I start researching the Fulcher family. Before we move on, it's important to take a history break. So what is life like in 1851? London is the most populated city in the world. They're getting better at sanitation, but the city's population is growing rapidly with both immigrants from around the world and, like in my family, Brits moving in from the country. In the midst of this shifting demographic landscape, they build a giant crystal palace to showcase the world's advances in technology in what is billed as the Great International Exhibition. Well, technically it was in Hyde Park, but you know what I mean. Luckily, one of those advances was public toilets, London's first. Another is photography. This is an actual photo of the Crystal Palace by Henry Fox Talbot, a chemist and a pioneer in photography. At this point, Martha's family isn't really living in close proximity to one another. So they probably don't get to see one another very often. I don't know if they were able to take advantage of the UK's expanding railroad network to visit one another or to be among the more than six million people who attended the Great Exhibition. So what can I tell you? First, let's talk about Emma. I am happy to report that by 1854, Joseph comes up to scratch and he and Emma marry. I get it that Joseph Wilson is just a periphery character in this story, but he is a bit of an enigma. In the last episode, I alluded that Joseph was the son of a gentleman and perhaps class differences had played a part in why he and Emma didn't marry. I didn't fabricate that idea, but now I'm not sure if it's true. If you are now assuming that this is the rabbit hole that I chose to go down, uh, you would be correct. And I've been at the bottom of it for a couple of weeks. 
Emma and Joseph get married on June 14th of 1854 at St. John the Evangelist Church in Lambeth, which is the church where Emma's mother, Martha, was married twice. This is not the same church where the bands were called three and a half years earlier. It is on this marriage record, this single piece of paper, that identifies Joseph Wilson's father as a gentleman and that his father's name was also Joseph Wilson. So I tried to find them both and the rest of their family. I thought it might help me piece together a story of why Emma and Joseph didn't marry and then why they did and where they were during the rest of Emma and Joseph's story. But I couldn't. One thing I was able to find about our Joseph Wilson was a letter to the editor of The Era, a theatrical newspaper that was published on January 6th, 1856. The letter corrected the newspaper, stating that it was, in fact, an artist named Joseph Wilson who had painted the scenery at the pantomime that was currently running in Liverpool. The letter further notes that this Joseph Wilson is an experienced scene painter having recent success in the London theaters. This letter is signed by Joseph Wilson. So at this point, I decided to crawl out of the rabbit hole, but I'm left wondering if Joseph has a supportive father living in Liverpool, or if he is the son of a surgeon residing in Chichester near England's southern coast, or if his mom perished from cholera and his father from asthma when he was just a toddler. Any of these are possible. I I don't know. What I do know is that by this time in 1856, Emma and Joseph have a six-month-old daughter named Martha Julia Caroline Wilson. By 1857, Emma and Joseph are residing in Brighton and have a daughter named Esther Eleanor Wilson. Their third child is a son born in 1858, Charles Joseph Cater Wilson, named after Emma's brother and husband. Seems things are going well for this family. They've survived the cholera epidemic that killed more than 20,000 people in Great Britain during the mid-1850s. They are living and raising their growing family in Brighton, a coastal town about 50 miles south of London and easily accessible by a train ride. But uh, things are about to take a turn. In 1859, Martha's employer, Viscount Villiers, inherits the title of the Earl of Jersey and then dies from tuberculosis 21 days later. He's in Brighton when he passes. That's not the only thing going wrong in Brighton. Emma's husband, Joseph Wilson, passes away in September of 1860. In another odd coincidence, the Wilson family resides on Brighton's Jersey Street. We know the street name because it appears on the baptismal record of Tessie Wilson, Emma's daughter, who was baptized in January of 1861, months after her father Joseph passed. Just a few months later, on April 7th, 1861, the English census was taken. This gives us a chance to check in on Martha and all of her family members. By 1861, Martha has returned to her birthplace of Froome, Somerset, and is recorded on the census living with a widower named Martin Maidment on Cross Street and his granddaughter. And a few weeks later, Martha marries Martin. They continue to reside on Cross Street, which has been Martin's home for many years. Oddly, we find all of Emma's children residing in a home on Jersey Street in Brighton. It appears that Martha Deering, a widow, has taken in all of Emma's children The oldest, Martha Julia, is only five years old. Esther is four, Charles is two, and Tessie is just five months old. Deering has her own nine-year-old son and no one else resides in the house, so clearly she has her hands full. Emma is not found on the 1861 census. 
but I do find Emma's brother, Charles William Henry Cater, residing in Marlbone, Middlesex, an area of London. He is working as a drapery assistant and living with other young men engaged in what is known as the rag trade. I eventually do find Emma. Emma Lavinia Wilson is on the death registry in the first quarter of 1862 in Marlbone. This took me aback a little. What is to become of those four orf- orphan children who at this point have essentially been staying with a neighbor? The boy, Emma's son Charles, goes to live with his grandmother Martha, who, as you know, just recently married a widower named Martin Maidment and lives in Froome, Somerset. But in December of 1862, four year old Charles dies. He is buried in the parish churchyard at Holy Trinity Church in Froome. The lives of his sisters seem to be equally as tragic. His older sister, Martha Julia Caroline Wilson, dies in London in 1870 at just 15 years old. She had been residing at 8 Lucas Terrace, an area of London called Bow, which is somewhat near the other areas where I have found family members in my research. Many addresses from mid 18th century London can still be identified on Google Maps. This was not one of them. But the address of 8 Lucas Terrace seems to me like it may have been a home, so she may have been working as a servant. In 1871, Esther Eleanor Wilson is living at the London Orphan Asylum in Clapton. It doesn't look like such a bad place until you learn that it was torn down in 1871, so it may not have been in all of its glory during the time that she lived there. Indeed, she is found on the death registry in June of 1871 in Hackney. She was just 14. That leaves Emma's youngest daughter, Tessie. She may have gone to live with her grandmother when her older brother Charles did in 1862, but we don't know because the next census isn't taken until 1871. And unfortunately, the main character of our story, Martha Hiscox, Trotman, Cater, Maidment, passed on May 24th, 1868 at the age of 60. After burying two husbands, a son-in-law, a daughter, and a grandson, it's a relief to know she didn't live long enough to see two of her granddaughters perish so young. On the civil death and burial registry for the third quarter of 1870, a 77-year-old Martin Maidment from Froome, Somerset is listed, Martha's third husband. So if Tessie was living with her step-grandfather for the past two years, she wouldn't be living with him in the 1871 census. Her older sister died before her step-grandfather and her other sister, who lived in an orphan asylum, passed by mid-1871. The fact of the matter is that we lose track of Tessie until I find a Tessie Wilson in Brighton and Hove on a 1929 voter registration record for East Hove. Okay, just a little bit more history. Otherwise known as a completely unrelated piece of information to the history of any member of my family or their subsequent journey, but may indeed help you in a game of trivia. In 1928, women in England, Wales, and Scotland gained the right to vote on the same terms as men over the age of 21. The Representation of the People Act of 1928 added 5 million more women to the electoral rolls, making 52.7% of the electorate of the UK's 1929 general election women. The history of the suffrage movement in the UK is fascinating. These women fought hard to be heard blowing things up, being jailed, going on hunger strikes, then being force-fed. But one of the more subtle ways the suffragists showed support and were able to identify one another was by wearing suffrage jewelry in the colors of green, 
purple, and white, which were the colors of the Women's Social and Political Union. Here's an example. Tessie Wilson lives in a row home on Tisbury Street, just a few blocks from the beach. The RW on this voting register indicates that Tessie fulfills the residency requirements to vote in Hove and that she is a woman. Today, the street is filled with beautiful row homes that look like they were built about 100 years ago. This is the only voting record where I find Tessie. She would have actually been eligible to vote in 1918 as she would have been over the age of 30. In fact, by 1929, Tessie would be 69 years old. I would like to think of her inside one of these beautiful row homes wearing a flapper dress, adorned with pearl, peridot, and amethyst jewelry, inviting her neighbors over for a cocktail, because I really need Tessie to have a happy ending. And that's it for today's episode of Spinster Aunt. But there will be a part three of Martha's story because not every one of her descendants experienced only tragedy. Her son, Henry Charles William Cater, makes the most of the rag trade. Oh, and the weird Earl of Jersey coincidences? They continue. Until next time, thanks for listening to Spinster Hands. <laughs> Hey, this is Spinster Ant with a little bonus at the very end, just a little teaser for an upcoming episode. I don't have a script, so please bear with me. Um, Okay, so if you're like me, you may have been wondering why Emma's children were so abandoned at the end of their life. And I was like, where's Emma's bestie? Where's Marianne? Like, Marianne was the witness at Emma's wedding when she finally got to marry Joseph Wilson. And, you know... Emma had been the witness at Mary Ann's wedding when she married William Rickards. And, um, you know, Joseph lived with Mary Ann and William Rickards. And I was like, what, what's going on here? Um, those are the people you really expect to kind of step up when, I don't know, you and your husband die and your children are orphaned. So um, I discovered a bit of a story today um, as I go through each of these siblings. Um, It's kind of hard to predict how the stories will overlap or how the stories will turn out. Um, But this one is a little crazy. And uh, stay tuned because it'll be one of those stories that you go, Ooh, oh, 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 oh. So, um, yeah. (laughs) Uh, Thanks for listening and being supportive and watching Spinster Ants. And uh, good luck in your research.